distinct. This will be important to bear in mind later. For it is tempting, since one of the truths is characterized as an ultimate truth, to think of the conventional as less true. Moreover, we will see later that while the truths are introduced as quite distinct here, they are in another sense identified later. It will be important to be very clear about the respective senses in which they are distinct and one. The term translated here as truth of worldly convention, Tib, Kuenrzab Denpa, SKT, Samvriti Satya, denotes a truth dependent upon tacit agreement, an everyday truth, a truth about things as they appear to accurate ordinary investigation, as judged by appropriate human standards. The term ultimate truth, Tib, Dampa Iden Gyib Denpa SKT, Paramartha Satya, denotes the way things are independent of convention, or to put it another way, the way things turn out to be when we subject them to analysis with the intention of discovering the nature they have from their own side, as opposed to the characteristics we impute to them. 9. Those who do not understand. The distinction drawn between these two truths do not understand. The Buddha's profound truth. 10. Without a foundation in the conventional truth, the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught. Without understanding the significance of the ultimate, liberation is not achieved. The goal of Madhyamaka philosophy is liberation from suffering. But that liberation, on Nagarjuna's view, can only be achieved by insight into the ultimate nature of things their emptiness and indeed into the ultimate nature of emptiness, which we shall see to be emptiness again. But this insight can only be gained through reasoning and hence through language and thought. And the truth that is to be grasped can only be indicated through language and thought, which are thoroughly conventional and which can only be interpreted literally at the conventional level. It is important to see here that Nagarjuna is not disparaging the conventional by contrast to the ultimate, but is arguing that understanding the ultimate nature of things is completely dependent upon understanding conventional truth. This is true in several senses, first, as we shall see, understanding the ultimate nature of things just as understanding that their conventional nature is merely conventional. But second, and perhaps less obscurely, in order to explain emptiness the ultimate nature of all phenomena one must use words and concepts and explain such things as interdependence, impermanence, and so forth. And all of these are conventional phenomena. So both in the end, where the understanding of ultimate truth is in an important sense the understanding of the nature of the conventional and on. The path, where the cultivation of such understanding requires the use of conventions, conventional truth, must be affirmed and understood. 11. By a misperception of emptiness. A person of little intelligence is destroyed. Like a snake incorrectly seized. Or like a spell incorrectly cast. The Madhyamaka doctrine of emptiness is subtle and is easily misinterpreted. In particular, it is often misinterpreted as a thoroughgoing nihilism about phenomena. This is so not only among classical Indian critics of Madhyamaka, in both Buddhist and non-Buddhist philosophical schools, but also among Western critics, who have sometimes regarded it as completely negative. In this respect, Madhyamaka philosophy has suffered from the same fate as much Western skeptical philosophy, including that of the Peronians and of Hume and Wittgenstein, all of whom were at considerable pains to warn readers against interpreting them as denying the existence of ordinary entities, but all of whom have been repeatedly read as doing so. Nagarjuna is here charging the opponent represented in the opening verses with interpreting the assertion that a phenomenon is empty as the assertion that it is non-existent. Nothing, Nagarjuna will argue, could be further from the truth. 12. For that reason that the Dharma is deep and difficult to understand and to learn the Buddha's mind despaired of being able to teach it. 13. You have presented fallacious refutations that are not relevant to emptiness. Your confusion about emptiness does not belong to me. Nagarjuna here simply denies that his view sustains the nihilistic reading, while granting that if one treats emptiness as non-existence, all of the absurd. Conclusions that the opponent enumerates indeed follow. But, Nagarjuna continues in Ziv, 14, the interpretation of the entire Madhyamaka system depends directly on how one understands the concept of emptiness. If that is understood correctly, everything else falls into place. If it is misunderstood, nothing in the system makes any sense. 14, for him to whom emptiness is clear, everything becomes clear. 
for him to whom emptiness is not clear, nothing becomes clear. 15. When you foist on us all of your errors. You are like a man who has mounted his horse and has forgotten that very horse. Here is the idea behind this image, a standard trope in classical Indian rhetoric, a man with a herd of horses thinks that he is missing one and accuses you of having stolen it. As he rides around and counts his horses, he always comes up one short. But you point out to him that the one he is. Accusing you of stealing is in fact the very one he is riding but has forgotten to count. Likewise, Nagarjuna is saying, the opponent who confuses the Madhyamaka analysis in terms of emptiness with nihilism is charging Nagarjuna with a nihilism that is in fact his own. Nagarjuna will argue, that is, that while the opponent claims to preserve the reality of the three jewels, the four noble truths, and dependently arisen phenomena against Nagarjuna's nihilism, Nagarjuna himself can explain the reality of these things, though it will turn out that on the opponent's view they must be non-existent. At this point the positive philosophical program of this chapter begins. 16. If you perceive the existence of all things in terms of their essence, then this perception of all things will be without the perception of causes and conditions. There are two related assertions contained in this critical verse. First, at the conventional level, the opponent, in virtue of thinking that to exist is to exist inherently, will be unable to account for dependent arising and hence for anything that must be dependently arisen. As Nagarjuna will make explicit later on, this will include such things as suffering, its causes, nirvana, the path thereto, the dharma, the sangha, and the buddha, as well as more mundane phenomena. But secondly and more subtly, since the opponent is seeing actual existence as existence as a discrete entity with an essence, it would follow that for the opponent the reality of emptiness would entail that emptiness itself is an entity, an inherently existing entity at that. To see emptiness in this way is to see it as radically different from conventional, phenomenal reality. It is to see the conventional as illusory and emptiness as the reality standing behind it. If Nagarjuna were to adopt this view of emptiness, he would indeed have to deny the reality of the entire phenomenal, conventional world. This would also be to ascribe a special, non-conventional, non-dependent hyperreality to emptiness itself. Ordinary things would be viewed as non-existent, emptiness as substantially existent. It is important and central to the Madhyamaka dialectic to see that these go together that nihilism about one kind of entity is typically paired with reification of another. This view is not uncommon in Buddhist philosophy, and Nagarjuna is clearly aware that it might be suggested by his own position. So Nagarjuna's reply must begin by distancing himself from this reified view of emptiness itself and hence from the dualism it entails. Only then can he show that to reify emptiness in this way would indeed entail the difficulties his imaginary opponent adumbrates, difficulties not attaching to.